Chapter V. Wall Street Wars. One of the accusations that has been influential in forming public opinion against Mr. Gould has been that he oppressed and betrayed Mr. Cyrus W. Field, and succeeded in getting from him his Manhattan Railway stock at a low figure, after which he placed much of it at a higher price with his own dot friends, thus enriching himself both ways. The full history covering this subject would be tedious, but the outlines should be clearly stated, and do not lack general interest. Mr. Field was a man of remarkable enthusiasm. His memorable work in uniting Europe and America by cable telegraph is the most conspicuous example. His wonderful SUCS was as highly estimated, and in a personal sense, better appreciated in England than in the United States. He received the most distinguished consideration, and the capitalists of London, more than of New York, had confidence in his judgment, and would place money according to his recommend. Dashen. So certain were they of his understanding. That their willingness to trust him, without seeking 6FQ. Go life of Jay Gould. Collateral testimony, was at times embarrassing, and it is due him to say that he was most cherry in the use of this peculiar and powerful public favor. His caution in making recommendations was very great. He did, however, tell his English and Scotch friends his opinion during the depressed times in the weir of the inevitable increase in the value of government securities. Some of them made large purchases, and consequently profits, and Mr. Field's reputation as a safe advisor was extended. He saw earlier than others the enormous requirements of rapid transit systems in our great cities, and the adaptation of the elevated roads to the needs of New York, and believed the intuition of discovery in this enterprise was greater as a matter of busyness than the Atlantic cable leadership. He had no shadow of doubt in his mind that the achievement of rapid transit by elevated roads would be of enormous public value and personal emolument. He saw, too, that the system that increased the value ease on the upper end of Manhattan Island would have the same influence downtown. The influ ince of the roads would be to expand the city and augment the demand for property at both ends of the line. The field building, no I Broadway, may be noted as proof of his foresight and his executive force. The vast elevated railway systems of New York and Brooklyn the most extensive and most comfortable rapid transit roads with which great calm. Wall Street Wars. Chi munities are provided anywhere in the world and with a wonderful record for rehability and safety, are the realization of his dreams. But more years and more money than he thought were required to make them what they are. The growth of the ELE VAT roads has been steady, as he was assured, but not so sweet as his anticipations. His intelligence did not fail him, but his characteristic impetuosity led low his losses. Mr. Gould and Mr. Field were closely associated in the elevated road enterprise, and highly estimated each other. They were so unlike that they formed a rare combination. The placid colon success of Mr. Gould was in fine contrast with the fiery ardor of Mr. Field. It was the weakness of Mr. Field that it was misery to him to wait. In accordance with his temperament, zeal, anxiety, and temperature a stock of corn should reach its full height in a few days instead of months. He knew Manhattan was one of the best things in the world. He actually knew was perfectly right about it but there was one of many calculations wrong. He did not make a sufficient allowance for the time necessary for the great city to adapt itself to the roads. He had a handsome fortune and had been so close to failure and ruin that he had gained what he believed were conservative habits of thought and circumspection in action. He insisted upon popularizing the roads, and carried his point of making the fares uniform and all the time five cents. Once the fact is almost forgotten there. 92 I dash, Faye of Jay Gould. Were 5 cent and 10 cent hours. When the Papu. Lar price was established the people accepted it as their right, and did not feel grateful to anybody. About it, and there were always many ready to assume that the Manhattan system was a horrid M monopoly owned by improperly rich men. The spirit of Mr. Field was as aggressive as it was intense, and if he had things at all he had them his way. He. 
invested all the capital that he could command in Manhattan and when it was for sale bought great blocks of it, raising money by putting up the stock as collateral. This was not accordiner to the iodcrement of Mr. Gould, who could see that the five-cent fares were not yielding. The dividends to sustain the property at the height of the figures of Mr. Field's purchases. He wisely held that carrying such masses of stock on margins growing narrow through the time needed for development was dangerous. Mr. Field held the opinion that the Manhattan stock could eventually be very largely disposed of on the London market at rates far above any that had been reached. The property was so famous, so much in evidence, so easily inspected, so under the eye, and obviously of enormous earning capacity, it was the best thing in the world for England. What Mr. Field could not permanently hold, he might easily and at an advance part with, and British gold would have been far better bestowed in Manhattan than in South America. Wall Street Wars. Where such a flood of it was poured out to evaporate. While Mr. Field was hopefully waiting and witnessing the gradual increase that was so absolute a matter to him that he had few misgivings, there came a financial flurry. The usual excitement contraction, loud calls, and sharp strain and MR. Field finally, with all his resources, found himself embarrassed. Mr. Gould has been accused of producing this state of things, but it was not his interest, not his game, his policy to do anything of the kind, and he had nothing more to do with it than with the tides or the procession of the seasons. Mr. Field was carrying 88,000 shares of the stock, $100 shares, par value of carat 8, 800, 000, and it had been boomed until it stood in the market at about percent backslash. Five million several banks were overloaded with it. There was imminent danger of the failure of MR Field, and if that event should occur there would be widespread disaster. There was one man with the nerve and other abilities equal to the emergency, and Mr. Field saw him and made a frank statement, and he took 78.000 shares of the stock at $120 or $9,360,000. This was the old figure of Mr. Gould's valuation of the property. He alone could or would make the purchase, and retain 50,000 of the shares that had been in Mr. Field's possession, and distribute 28,000 shares at the price he paid, several of his friends declining the stock because they did not want it, and it fell to 77 before the advance set 7. 54 LTFE of J. Gould. In, and it is not even yet quite up to the point where Mr. Field had it. Of course Mr. Gould did not lose any money by this transaction, but he had to wait. He could afford to wait, and so saved himself and Fwan at last. If he had not met the crisis with Courage and had not been equipped for the Emmer Jenki, there would have been a great public calamity. Carrot, Mr. Field was relieved, but his losses impaired his fortune, and after a time other troubles came for which he was not accountable. Mr. Gould cannot justly be charged with his misfortunes, and the incident we relate is a display of his capacity to grasp great affairs, and the unerring integrity of his judgment. Following is the full text of the correspondence between Mr. Gould and Mr. T. V. Powderly, Grand Master Workman of the Knights of Labor, at the time when Mr. Gould was president of the Missouri Pacific Railroad, which was plunged in a terrible strife with the Knights of Labor. Those strikes have gone down into our history as among the most disastrous conflicts between capital and labor that have ever taken place. No better idea of the principles involved in the strike or of the animus of the leaders on both sides can be obtained than through this official core. Spondence. The following letters are a history in themselves. Ival Street Wars. G.C. Noble Order of the Knights of Labor of America, Office of General Secretary, Philadelphia, March 27. Mr. J. Gould, Sir the General Executive Board would be pleased to have an interview with you at your convenience today for the purpose of submitting the Southwest difficulties to a committee of seven, seven, for arbitration, three of the committee to be AP appointed by yourself and three by the General Executive Board, the six to select the seventh member of the committee, their decision in the matter to be final. Should this proposition be acceptable, we will at once issue an order for the men to return to work. 
By order of the General Executive Board, Frederick Turner, Secretary of Board. The Missouri Pacific Railway Company. New York, March 27. Frederick Turner, ESQ, Secretary, etc., Philadelphia, PA. Dear Sir I have your note of this date propoing an interview between your executive commit. T and the officers of this company, for the purpose of submitting to arbitration by a committee of seven what you term the Southwestern Difficulties. You are doubtless aware that, in the negotiations which took place here last August between Mr. TV. G6 Life of Jay Gould. Powderly, Grand Master Workman and Associates and the officers of this company, it was agreed that, in future, no strikes would be ordered on the Missouri Pacific Road until after a conference with the officers of the company and an opportunity to adjust any alleged grievances. In view of this fact, attention is drawn to the following correspondence between Mr. A. Hopkins, Vice President, acting for this company in my absence, and Mr. Powderly. New York, March 6, 1886. T.V. Powderly, Scranton, P.A., Mr. Hoxie telegraphs that knights of labor on our road have struck and refused to allow any freight trains to run on our road, saying they have no grievance, but are only striking because they are ordered to do so. If there is any grievance we would like to talk it over with you. We understood you to promise that no strike should be ordered without consultation. A.L. Hopkins. Philadelphia, PA, March 8, 1886. A.L. Hopkins, Secretary Missouri Pacific Railroad, 195 Broadway, New York, have telegraphed west for particulars. Papers say strike caused by discharge of man named Hall. Can he be reinstated pending investigation? T. V. Powderly. W. A. L. L. Street Wars. Q. New York, March 8, 1886. T. V. Powderly. Thanks for your message and suggestion. Hall was employed by the Texas and Pacific and not by us. That property is in the hands of the United States court, and we have no control whatever over the receivers or over the employees. We have carried out the agreements made last spring in every respect, and the present strike is unjust to us and unwise for you. It is reported here that this movement is the result of Wall Street influence on the part of those short of the securities likely to be affected. A.L. Hopkins no reply to this message was received, but this company's request for a conference was ignored and its premises at once invaded and its property destroyed by the men of your order in great number bears, who also seized and disabled its trains, as they have since continued to do, whenever attempting to run. The board of directors of this company thereupon had a copy of the correspondence above given made and transmitted to Mr. H. N. Hoxie, the first vice president and general manager at St. Louis, with instructions to use every endeavor to continue the operation of the road and commit the whole matter to his hands. Mr. Hoxie's overtures, made through the Gover, Nors of Missouri and Kansas, who stated that they Q8 life of J.A.V. Gould found no cause for the strike, were rejected by your order. These and the subsequent correspondence between him and Mr. Powderly are well known to you, and Mr. Hoxie's course has been confirmed by the board and the matter is still in his hands. I am therefore instructed by the board to refer you to him as its continuing representative in the premises. I am directed to add in behalf of the board, that in its judgment so long as this company is forcibly kept from the control of its property and from performing its charter duties, its business is done, if at all, not under the conditions of law, which are common to all citizens, but only at the will of a law-breaking force. Any negotiations with such a force would be unwise and useless. Terms made with it would not be a settlement of difficulties, but a triumph of force over the law of the land. It would mean nothing in their judgment but new troubles and worse. This is the result of their experience. In the meantime, the governor's proclamation enjoins upon your men to return to duty, and this company's continued advertisement offers them employment on the same terms as heretofore.
The board further suggests that inasmuch as your order assuming in your communication responsibility for these men, and power, and control over them, the fall. Lowing, from the proclamation of the governor of Miss. Sowery, is expressive of their duty and of your own. I warn all persons, whether they be employees or not, against interposing any obstacle, whether in backslash i4 ll stkeft irars ng the way of said resumption, and wit lie a firm reliance upon the courage, good sense, and law-abiding spirit of the public, I hereby call upon all good citizens to assist in carrying out the purposes of this PROC law mission, and I also hereby pledge the whole power of the state, so far as it may be lawfully wielded by its chief executive officer, to sustain the company and its servants in said resumption, and to restrain and punish all that may oppose it. When this proclamation shall be obeyed, and when the company's late employees shall desist from violence and interference with its trains, the board hereby assures them that they will find themselves met by Mr. Hoxie in the spirit in which he has heretofore so successfully avoided rupture and cause for just complaint, and in that just and liberal spirit which should always exist between the employer and the employed. By order of the board, very respectfully yours. J. Gould, President Missouri Pacific Rakeway Company. Personal. Missouri Pacific Railroad Company, New York, March 29, 1886. T.V. Powderly, ESQ, New York City, Dear Sir The Papers This Morning Publish The Following Message. President Jay Gould has consented to our proposition for arbitration, and so telegraphs Vice President Hoxie. Order the men to resume at once. Signed, T.V. Powderly, GMW. Lou Life of JGO Um. They also publish an interview with you, which leads me to think that the officers of your order in St. Louis may misconstrue your message into a consent on the part of this company to conform to the request contained in the letter from the secretary of your order, dated Philadelphia, March 27th, which in my letter to you of the same date I declined to consider. You will remember that in our conference of yesterday, I said to you that the position of this company was unchanged in this respect, and that the whole matter was left in the hands of the first vice president and general manager, with the instructions contained in my telegram to him, which was written before my interview with you and read to you at the time. This telegram stated, We see no objection to arbitrating any difference between the employees and the company, past or future. While I feel confident that your understanding of this matter is the same as my own, I write you this. In order that there may be no grounds for misun. Der standing hereafter. Very respectfully yours, J. Gould, President Missouri Pacific RR Co. M. R. Powderly to M. R. Gould. Scranton, PA, April 10, 1886. J. Gould, ESQ, President Missouri Pacific Railroad. Dear Sir the events of the past 48 hours must have demonstrated to you the absolute necessity of bringing this terrible struggle in the South. Wall Street Wars. Loy. West to a speedy termination. You have the power, the authority, and the means to bring the strike to an end. I have done everything in my power to end the strife. The gentlemen associated with me on the General Executive Board of the Knights of Labor have done the same. Everything consistent with honor and manhood has been done in the interest of peace. No false notions of pride or dignity have swayed us in our dealings with you or the gentlemen associated with you. In that conference with you on Sunday, March 2 STH, I understood you to mean that arbitration would be agreed to. The only method of arbitration that was discussed was in line with that suggested in the letter which I sent to you in the name of our board the day previous. There was nothing particular agreed upon, as you well know. You said that in arbitrations for the matter the damages SU attained by the company during the strike ought to receive consideration. I said to you that it would not be the part of wisdom to bring that question up in the settlement of the strike. When I called upon you again that evening you had prepared, as the result of your understanding of the morning's interview, a letter which you intended to give me. That letter included a telegram to be sent to Mr. Hoxie, 
and in that telegram you said that the damages sustained by the company would be a proper subject for the arbitration board to discuss. This latter part of the letter or telegram you agreed to strike off after we. I-02 Life of Jay Golb Had talked the matter over for some time, and I left you as you were about to go to your RO6M to rewrite the letter, which you afterward placed in the hands of Mr. McDowell to be given to me, for I had to leave at that time in order to keep an appointment at the hotel where I stopped. The statement which you have since made, to the effect that you had prepared that letter before I called, is not quite correct, or if you did have it prepared you changed it after we talked the matter over for some time. This I believe you will admit to be true. In the conference held between the members of our executive board and the directors of the Missouri Pacific Company, at number 195 Broadway, on March 30th, you said to me that you understood me to say that the men along your lines would be ordered back to work at once, they having violated the rules of our organization. I then reiterated the statement which I have made to you, and now repeat it. The men out along the lines of your railways can be ordered back to work, but if they are given to understand that they are deserted, that we do not take any interest in them, it will not in any way mend matters, on the contrary, it will make things worse. There are, all along the roads out there, a great many men who have no regard for organization or law, men of hardy spirit, energy, and daring. Such men as have left the East and have taken up their homes out in a wild country such as that is will not submit as Wall Street Wars IO3 Quietly as the merry they left behind in the East, they are apt to do rasher things than they would do elsewhere, and I have no doubt we have some in our order, in fact, our NY experience with the men of that vast section leads me to think that the men on both sides out there are more daredevilish than they are in the East. Even the businessmen cf that country are of that stamp of character. Both you and Mr. Hopkins heard me make that statement, and I believe the latter agreed that that was his experience also. The danger of the strike spreading was also discussed, and I said to you that it would not spread, that an effort had been made to have the men of the Union Pacific take a part in it, but that the Negrits of labor on that road had a standing agreement with the management of the road that there was to be no trouble or strike until the last effort to effect a settlement had failed, and not then until the court of last resort had been reached. When I made that statement Mr. Hop, Kins remarked that they had better strike then, for if they did not, the Union Pacific would not much longer have sufficient money to pay their employees. The impression made on me was that you would be pleased to see a strike take place on the Union Pacific. This, I believe, covers the chief points of Discus Zion. I did not hear either you or Mr. Hopkins say that the present trouble out along your road would hot be arbitrated with the men who were not it. I-04 Life of Jay Gould Work it was my FTRM belief when I left you that night that you meant to have the entire affair submitted to arbitration at the first possible moment. That belief is shared by Mr. McDowell, who was present during the entire interview. When you sent the telegram to Mr. Hoxie you sent it as president of the Missouri Pacific Railroad Company. You sent it as the chief sends his message to an inferior officer, and it meant as much to a sensible man as the most imperative order could possibly mean. When I, as the chief officer of the Knights of Labor, send a message such as that, it is understood to be my wishes, and those wishes are respected by the subordinate officer to whom they are sent. It is not his place to put a different construction on them and give them his own interpretation. His duty is to obey the spirit of the instruction. The man in power need not be an autocrat in order to have his wishes respected. I would like to see it done comes with as great a force from the man in authority is I must have it done that was the idea that I entertained when I left your house that night I also explained to you at your house that night that the men who had entered upon the strike had not violated any law of the order in so doing that while I thought it would have been better if they had laid their grievances before the general executive board before striking yet there was nothing in our laws to command them to do so I said that a district assembly of the NEOHTS of Wall Street Wars, IO5, 
Labor bore the same relation to the General Assembly, of which I am the chief officer, that one of the states of the American Union had to the general government of the United States, and that, while I could interfere, it was under the law which gave me jurisdiction over the entire order, and not under any particular law. I furthermore explained to you that the spirit of our organization, its genius, was opposed to strikes, and that was the reason why our general convention never enacted any particular legislation for the government of them. I also said that the occasion had never before called for any interference from the general officers, but that this strike would show the necessity for the passage, at our next convention, of laws that would place the subject of strikes under the control of the General Executive Board of the General Order. When, on Monday, March 29, Yo sent me the letter marked personal, you, at the same time, told a newspaper correspondent that you had done. So, what your motive was in marking your letter personal and at the same time informing a representative of the press that you so addressed me, I do not know, nor do I question your motive. I felt it to be my duty to let the public see the letter, which contained nothing of a personal nature whatever. There are people who might be uncharitable enough to say that your intention was to give out the impression that there was something between you and me which would not bear the light of public. 106 Life off Ye Gould Scrutiny. I have had no such dealings with any man since this trouble began, nor previous to that time. I am quite willing to allow the fullest light possible to shine upon my every transaction. I have nothing to conceal. You can settle this strike. Its longer continuance rests with you, and you alone. Every act of violence, every drop of blood that may be shed from this time forth, must be laid at our door. The Knights of Labor were not founded to promote or shield wrongdoing, and today the order of the Knights of Labor stands between your property and ruin. We are willing to absolve the men along your railways from their allegiance to our order, we leave that to themselves. We will not allow any claims which the order may have on them to stand between them and their restoration to their former positions. The order of the Knights of Labor asks of no man to remain a member if it is not to his interest to do so. You may deal with them as citizens if you will. We will surrender our right to claim these men as MEM bears if they wish, but we will not surrender our right to see this affair thoroughly investigated. You have said that the order of the Knights of Labor was a conspiracy, a secret menace, etc. I am willing, as the chief officer, to lay everything connected with our order bare to the world, if you will, on the other hand, lay open to the public the means and methods whereby you have piled up wealth which you control, and allow the tribunal of Ival Street Was. IO7. Public opinion to pass in judgment on the two and say which is the conspiracy. Do you accept the challenge? You have instructed your legal adviser to proceed against every man connected with the Knights of Labor for the damages sustained since the strike began. Two weeks ago I said, do not do this. Today I say begin at once, lay claims for damages in every court within whose jurisdiction a knight exists. Proceed at once, and in every state where you can recover damages do so if the law will sustain you in it. Let the majesty of the law be vindicated, it is just and right that it should be so. We are willing to face you before the law. We will fight you with no other weapon. For every violation of the law of state or nation we will enter suit against you and in this crusade against you do not understand that we mean to prosecute. On the contrary, we wish to see the law vindicated. If you have at all times obeyed the law in your dealings, in the methods by which you have acquired your immense fortune, then it is time that the many offenses with which you are charged should be refuted. You have remained silent under many a damaging charge of injuring the state. We will be your avengers. If you have been wronged we will let it be known to the world through the medium of the courts of justice. And let me say right here that no money will buy a verdict at the hands of these courts. I-08 Life of Jay Gould There are people who say that this struggle is the beginning of the war between capital and labor. That statement is false. This certainly means war, but it is a war between legitimate capital, honest enterprise, and honest labor on the one hand, and I'll get them at wealth on the other hand. This is a war in which we court the fullest investigation of our acts. 
Do you dare to do the same? This war means no further strike, no shedding of blood, it is a war in which every businessman, every commercial man, every professional man, every working man will be invited to enlist. It will not be a war upon the innocent and the battlefield upon which it will be fought out will be before the two courts of law and that which makes law, public opinion. There will be no mobs in this supreme hour to silence any man's opinion. No converts will be made by physical eichel force. That flag which floats over press or mansion at the bidding of a mob, disgraces. Both victor and victim, and under such a flag is. That we will not wage the battle, but this battle of the people against monopoly may as well be fought now as ten years from now, and what field so eminently proper in which to fight it out as before the courts. Let us know whether laws were made to be obeyed or not, and if they were not so framed then the people must make laws that will be obeyed. No man, whether he be rich or whether he be the poorest of the poor, shall in future shirk the responsibility of his acts and shield himself behind the walls to eat ivis. J.O.Q. Courts. It was to see that the laws were obeyed that the order of the Knights of Labor was founded and if the day has come to make the trial, so let it be. I do not write this letter to you either in the spirit of anger or revenge. For you personally I have no dislike. I believe that, if allowed to follow your own impulses in this matter, you would have had the strike ended ere this. Those who advise you do not mingle with the people, they do not care for the people. You have been warned that your life is in danger. Pay no attention to such talk, no man who has the interest of his country at heart would harm a hair of your head. But the system which reaches out on all sides, gathering in the mill lions of dollars of treasure and keeping them out of the legitimate channels of trade and commerce, must die, and the men whose money is invested in the enterprises which stock gambling has throttled must make common cause with those who have been to need the right to earn enough to provide the merest necessaries of life for home and family. When I say to you that we will meet you in the courts I do not speak rashly or ill-advisedly. I have taken counsel from the best legal minds of the United States. We are prepared to face you before the courts, and now await your action in the matter. This is no threat. I play no game of bluff or chance. I speak for 500,000 organized men, who are ready to pay out the last farthing in order that justice may prevail you have it in your power to. JJQ Life of J. Gould Make friends of these men by acting the part of the man, by taking this matter in your own hands. Will you do so, and end this strife in the interest of humanity in our common country? It is your duty to brush aside every obstacle, assert your authority, and take this matter in your hands, settle every grievance, restore every man to his place, except those who have been eno acred in the destruction of property or who have broken the laws. Will you do this? You can then make rules and agreements with your men which will forever preclude the P.O.S. civility of another such disastrous conflict as this one has proved itself to be. I remain yours very truly, T.V. Powderly, G.M.W.K. of L. The Reply of M.R. Gould The reply of Mr. Gould includes copies of previous correspondence. It is as follows. New York, April 14, 1886 TV. Powderly, ESQ, GMWK of L. Dear Sir, at 12 o'clock today I received from Mr. William O. McDowell, whom you brought with you to our recent conferences, a letter in which he says, By yesterday's mail I received a letter written by Mr. Powderly addressed to you, enclosed in a letter addressed to me. With this, I hand to you the letter addressed to you by Mr. Powderly, and a copy of Mr. Powderly's letter to me enclosing the same. Ival Street Ivars. IX1 The following is a copy of the letter Mr. McDowell. L sent me as coming from you, General Assembly Order of Knights of Labor of America. Office of General Master Workman, Scranton, Penn, April 13, 1886. My dear Mr. McDowell I enclose you a letter which you are to read and deliver to the man for whom it is intended. I do not care whether you deliver it in person or through the medium of another only ask that it be placed in his hands. If you have succeeded in effecting a settlement with him, do not give it to him. 
If you think there is a prospect of an immediate settlement, and do not give it to him, but if such is not the case, then I want it placed in his hands. Allow him to either consent or to make a reply. If he consents to an honorable settlement, then the letter will never see the light of day, but if he does not so act, then it will be published to the world, and from the time he opens up the ball in a legal way, we will continue to wage the battle with him. His wealth cannot save him if this fight is begun. Let no one know of the exist. Ince of this letter until after five o'clock of the da, comma. You deliver it, then if he makes no reply, let it go to the world. Let him know the limit of time allowed. I sincerely hope that there will be no necessity for its publication. Hoping for the best, I remain, very truly yours, TV Powderly. J12 Life OFJAY Gould. I have received your letter to me dated, Scranton, Penn, April 10, 1886, at the same time and by the same agency that I received your foregoing. Letter of Instructions to Mr. McDowell. The animus and purpose of your letter to me cannot be fully understood without knowing the contents of that one. I was peremptorily notified at the same time that I must answer your letter by five o'clock today, and I was graciously given until that hour to respond. Your letter to me embraces two subjects, one relating to me personally, and the other to the relation of the Knights of Labor to a railroad company of which I am the president, and, in some degree, the representative of its public and private duties. I shall refer to the first subject very briefly. Till I circumstances above given, under which your letter was delivered, as well as its tenor and spirit, place the purpose in writing it beyond any fair doubt. It would seem to be an official declaration that the Knights of Labor had determined to pursue me personally unless the Missouri Pacific Company should yield to its demands in what you call the strike on that road. In answer to these personal threats, I beg to say that I am yet a free American citizen. I am past 49 years of age, was born at Roxbury, Delaware County, in this state. I began life in a lowly way, and by industry, temperance, and attention to my own business have been so successful, perhaps beyond the measure of my deserts. If, as you say, I am. IRL Street Wars. IJ now to be destroyed by the knights of labor unless I will sink my manhood, so be it. Fortunately, I have retained my early habits of industry. My friends, neighbors, and business associates know me well, and I am quite content to leave my personal record in their hands. If any of them have aught to complain of, I will be only too glad to submit to any arbitration. If such parties or any of them wish to appoint the knights of labor or you as their attorney, such appointment is quite agreeable to me, but until such an election is made it will any to really occur to you that any interference on your part in my personal affairs, is to say the least, quite gratuitous. Since I was 19 years of age I have been in the habit of employing in my various enterprises large numbers of persons, probably at times as high as 50,000, distributing carrot 3 comma 0 0 0 comma 0 0 0 or carrot 4 comma 0 0 0 comma 0 0 0 per month to different payrolls. It would seem a little strange that during all these years the difficulty with the Knights of Labor should be my first. Any attempt to connect me personally with the late strike on the southwestern roads, or any responsibility therefore, is equally gratuitous, as you well know. It is true I am president of the Missouri Pacific, but when this strike occurred I was far away on the ocean and beyond the reach of telegrams. I went away relying on your promise made to me last August that there should be no strike on that road, and that if any difficulties should arise you would come frankly to me with them. Mr. Hop. JJ for life OFJAV could. Kins, the vice president of this company, who was present and cognizant of this arrangement with you, in my absence sent you promptly, when the present strike broke out, the following telegrams. New York, March 6, 1886. TV Powderly, Scranton, Penna, Mr. Hoxie telegraphs that Knights of Labor on our road have struck and refused to allow any freight trains to run, saying they have no grievances, but are only striking because ordered to do so. If there is any grievance we would like to talk it over with you. 
We understood you to promise that no strike would be ordered without consultation. A.L. Hopkins. Philadelphia, Penna, March 8, 1886. A.L. Hopkins, Secretary Missouri Pacific Railroad, New York, have telegraphed West for particulars. Papers, say strike caused by discharge of man named Hall. Can he be reinstated pending investigation? TV Powderly. New York, March 8, 1886. TV Powderly, thanks for your messages and suggestion. Hall was employed by the Texas and Pacific, and not by us. That property is in the hands of the United States court, and we have no control whatever over the receivers or other employees. We have car. Wall Street WAKS. JJT. Write out the agreements made last spring in every respect, and the present strike is unjust to us, and unwise for you. It is reported here that this movement is the result of Wall Street influence on the part of those short of the securities likely to be affected A.L. Hopkins. This dispatch you never answered. This correspondence places the continuance of this strike on your shoulders. You sat still and were silent after Mr. Hopkins' appeal, and allowed the strike to go on allowed the company's property to be forcibly seized and the citizens of four states and one territory to be deprived of their rightful railway facilities. Thus forced, the board of directors, prior to my return, placed the carrot matter in Mr. Hoxie's hands by a formal resolution, and that disposition of it has never been changed. You knew this well, because you had a correspondence with him on this subject. Hence it was that when Mr. Turner, Secretary of your order, wrote to me on the subject, I fully advised him, in my letter of March 27, that the matter had been placed by the board in the hands of Mr. Hoxie, and that I must refer you to him as its continuing representative. At the same time I reminded you that a standing advertisement of this company was at that moment inviting its former employees to return to their accustomed posts, and that regardless of their being or not being members of your order, and regardless also of their indie JJG Life of Jay Gould Vigual participation in the strike which your order had recently inaugurated When, in spite of all this, you desired to see me personally, I cordially met you, and, having put myself in communication with Mr. Hoxie, arranged with him for you the following, which was widely published by you at the time. New York, March 30, 1869. Martin Irons, St. Louis. Have been in conference all day, with the result that Vice President Hoxie agrees to the following. Willing to meet a committee of our employees without discrimination, who are actually at work in the service of the company at the time such committee is appointed, to adjudicate with them any grievance that they may have. Have your executive committee order the men to return to work, and also select a special committee from the employees of the Missouri Pacific to wait on Mr. Hoxie to adjust any difference. Do this as quickly as possible. Board will leave for St. Louis tomorrow. Frederick Turner, Secretary. Ever since then Mr. Hoxie has stood ready to receive any and all persons in the actual employ of this company as a committee or otherwise, and confer upon or arbitrate any matter of difference or complaint either between the company and themselves or between the company and its late employees, and, for that matter, between the company. Wall Street Wars. IJ7 and anybody else. No such committee or individual employee has, so far as known to me ever made any such application. In this connection it will be remembered that they left not because of any complaint whatever of this company's treatment of themselves, but only because of this company's refusal to comply with their demand that this company refuse to do what the law requires in the way of interchange of business with another company, with which some of your order had a quarrel. In the meantime this company has of necessity gone on to extend employment to such of those persons who recently, and without even alleged provocation, left its service, as saw fit to return. These returning employees have been very many, and in this way its roles are already nearly, if not quite, as full as its shops and equipment, crippled by acts of violence attendant upon recent action of your order, can employ. Mr. Hoxie advises that 
every such person applying to be received back has been employed, unless believed to have taken part in recent acts of violence. This company still stands ready to make good in the fullest sense its agreement is expressly set forth. In the face of all this you notify me that unless by five o'clock I personally consent to something, precisely what I do not see, then personal consequences of a sort vaguely expressed, but not hard to understand, will at the hand of your order be visited upon me. Let me again remind you that it. IJ3 Life of J.A.Y. Gould is an American citizen whom you and your order thus propose to destroy. The contest is not between your order and me, but between your order and the laws of the land. Your order has already defied those laws in preventing by violence this company from operating its road. You held then that this company should not operate its road under conditions prescribed by law, but only under conditions prescribed by you. You now declare in effect that I hold my individual property and rights, not as other men hold theirs, but only at the peril of your letting loose irrevocably after five o'clock your order upon me. If this is true of this company and of me, it is true of all other men and companies. If so, you and your secret order are the law, and, and an American citizen is such only in name. Already for weeks your order, and your attack upon this company, has not hesitated to disable it by violence from rendering its duty to the public and from giving work and paying wages to men at least three times your own number, who, working as they were by your side, were at least deserving of your sympathy. Having pushed this violence beyond even the greatest forbearance of the public, and found in this direction cause to hesitate, you now turn upon me and propose that the wrongs you have hitherto inflicted on the public shall now culminate in an attack upon an individual. In this, as I have said, the real issue is between you and the law of the land. It may be, before you. Wall Street Wars. UG. Are through, those laws will efficiently advise you that even I, as an individual citizen, am not beyond their care. Very respectfully, J. Gould. The following condensed report, embracing the operations of the Missouri Pacific Railway Company, and its leased, operated, and independent lines, for the year ending December 31, 1891, is here given. It will MVE the reader an excellent idea of the vast scope of the system for which Mr. Gould fought so valiantly. The average mileage of all lines operated during the Y carat AR was 5,282.61 miles, an increase of 173.61 miles over the previous year. The mileage of all lines on December 31, 1891, was 5,288.85 miles, an increase of 163.85 miles, compared with same date of previous year. The above increase in mileage consists of the Fort Scott and Southern Railway, Fort Scott to C.O. Arnell, Kansas, 27.20 miles, opened January 26, 1891, the Fort Scott Belt Terminal Railway, comprising terminal and connecting tracks at Fort Scott, Kansas, 3.91 miles, opened January 26, 1891, Omaha Southern Railway, Union to Plattsmouth, Nebraska, 14.71 miles, opened September 9, 1891, Houston, Central Arkansas and Northern Line, McGee. Arc, to Riverton, L.A., Washita River, 118.68 miles, in Clud in System Mileage January East, 1891, a net deduction of 0.65 miles from the system mileage of I-20 Lee Carrot Carrot of J. Could. 1890 was effected by correction of distances, making the aggregate increase in mileage during the year 163.85 miles. The relations of the several properties remained practically unchanged during the year. By Indentour, dated January East, 1891, the Kansas City and Southwestern Line, Paola, Kansas, to Cecil, M.O., 48,23 miles, was leased to the Missouri Pacific Railway Company for a term of 99 years, making the aggregate mainline mileage of the Missouri Pacific Company 1,542.45.
The Kansas and Colorado Pacific Railway comprises 1,057.13 miles of lines in Kansas, to which has been added, since the close of the year, the Fort Scott, Wichita and Western Railway, by purchase, 309.85 miles, and the Pueblo and State Line Railroad, by lease, 151.89 miles. Additional independent lines, aggregating 130.21 miles, complete the mileage of 1,649.08 miles, treated in operating accounts as branch lines of the Missouri Pacific Railway. The St. Louis, Iron Mountain and Southern Rail Way, including the Little Rock and Fort Smith, Little Rock Junkdon, and Kansas and Arkansas Valley Divisions, comprises an aggregate mileage of 1,547.22 miles. The Houston, Central Arkansas and Northern Line, McGehee, Ark, to Riverton, LA, 118.68 miles, was operated during the year as an independent property, in connection with the Iron Mountain system.